you know the rules, three rolls on the tower, they each correspond to a random question I have, and that is where our conversation begins. You got it. If you could swap roles with anybody in the Barry Ensemble to play one specific scene of theirs, who would you pick and why? Ooh, that's such a good question. Well, my instinct is to say no ho Hank, just because I think it'd be the most fun. And a particular scene, oh my goodness. Um, there's so many brilliant ones. Maybe when, <laughs> I think it's season two, when he goes into Lululemon with the wig, um, I feel like I feel like season four was so heavy for me. It would be nice to go do some clowning around in a wig. I mean, I guess I had a wig too. Different kind of wig. This one is perfect because you just brought up NoHo Hank, and this is kind of uh, tied to him. This is called Dave and Buster's. So, in Ooh. honor of Hank. What is your favorite game at Dave and Buster's and are you actually good at it? You know what, as a Canadian who lives in England, I have never been to a Dave and Buster's. I retract my original answer. I'm gonna do Dave and Buster's. Would it be like a Chuck E. Cheese? Would they have like skee-ball? Oh yes. Okay, then I would go skee-ball. I'm always, I'm, I always love skee-ball. It's very addictive, reminds me of bowling, you know. I fail miserably at it, I love it. We are wrapping this up with a number two. Oh, you got a lot of my silly questions. So this is the newest Dice Tower question because this happened to me while I was writing questions for a recent ladies night. This one is just called Spider. And I think this says a lot about someone. So you are home alone, you see a gigantic spider. What do you do about it? Well, this is gonna be quite an embarrassing, vulnerable story, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you. When I was staying in LA this season for season four, I was in this lovely little cottage in Venice, but I was really homesick. I really miss my husband and I really miss my dog. And this really big, quite beautiful, harmless looking spider uh, moved into the corner of the bedroom and I actually named it. <laughs> I think it was Pete, and it was my pet for season four. Not even joking you, we were having chats. Pete was there for like a good 45 days, I would say. And then one day Pete like disappeared. It got a little tense at times. Like there was another spider for a while and it was like David Attenborough. They were like going at each other. I didn't know if one was gonna eat the other one or it was a mating ritual. Anyway, I miss Pete. He just disappeared on me, but yeah, so probably as a Canadian, I would keep it and name it. Yeah, tragic, I know. No, it's not. This answer makes me so happy because <laughs> I am very much against the like smush it and trash it no. method. I, I do the double cup and I just, I take it outside and I set it free. Double cup is good. I often do, yeah, large glass cup. Like if it's a scary one, he was like very friendly and slept a lot, I think. But if it's like a really kind of mobile one with fangs, yeah, I try to get a big glass cup and then put the paper under the cup, like a thin sheet of paper, get it out. Yeah, that's 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 the move. I can't kill them, it's bad luck. I respect literally everything about this answer. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I would share that to anyone, <laughs> let alone to the internet. What's up everyone? Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night with a favorite, Sarah Goldberg, who absolutely crushes it from beginning now to the end of Barry. Congratulations on four stellar seasons. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on your show. What is the movie, the performance, personal experience, you name it, that first made you say to yourself, I have to be an actor and nothing else? I'd say that when I was um, around 12, we got this incredible drama teacher at our school. He came, he was like the king of the fringe in Canada. His name was Michael Wiener, is Michael Wiener, he's still there. Um, he was this incredibly passionate teacher and he had this big mop of curly hair and he swore in class, you know, like it was, he was crazy. And he was so passionate about theater. And if, if you were serious about theater, he was serious about you. And we must have done, I don't know, a dozen productions between grade eight and 12. And I, the first one we did together was The Visit. But I'd say it was, we were doing The Diary of Anne Frank. And um, yeah, and I was playing Mrs. Van Dam. And uh, I think that that was the first play that I did where I thought, you know what, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. 
you also studied at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts. So can you tell me something that you learned in that program that you still find yourself referring back to and using to this day? But then also, I want something that all the schooling in the world never could have prepared you for when you hit your first professional set or stage, I guess. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Well, um, I think the thing that really stuck with me the most was just learning to make a fool of myself. <laughs> I think that acting in many ways, you know, the thing that's hardest about it is that it's very embarrassing at times. And you really have to kind of get out of your own way and allow yourself to become these other people and let these stories kind of channel through you. And I feel like in theater school, we had to do all sorts of crazy things from clown, to something called Buffon, which is like, you know, from um, physical theater training. It's sort of like crazy, dark, twisted characters. And we had to do all sorts of things in, in front of each other and fail spectacularly on a regular basis. And so you just get rid of that feeling of, of, of embarrassment. You're just able to humiliate yourself in public. And you know, that comes in handy in the job. <laughs> so that, that really has stuck with me and that, you know, especially on Barry, you know, there was a real kind of best idea wins attitude on set. But in order to get that best to that best idea, sometimes it felt like we had to throw out 10 bad ideas, you know, and you have to have the guts to kind of swing big and miss to kind of, to get to the place that we would ultimately get to. So that is something I really picked up in theater school. Something that I couldn't have been prepared for. I mean, there's so many things to be honest, because as lovely as theater school training is, I mean, what a joy to prance around in tights all day from eight to eight and, you know, make little plays with your friends. Um, nothing can really prepare you for being an actor, the life of an actor. And that one of the hardest parts about being an actor is the time that you're not working and understanding what to do with that time and being able to fill yourself up creatively, to feel like a productive member of society to not lean into wearing your bathrobe into the mid-afternoon, you know. So that, I think, took me a while to learn how to use my downtime well. Um, it often involved, like, signing up for classes, you know, guitar lessons, or something where you felt like there's some kind of creative output just for that's for yourself, really. Um, and, yeah, I think the other thing that they really can't prepare you for is is interviews and press, you know, in that you never realize that you're going to end up talking about a thing more than doing the thing itself. <laughs> so that, that part of it is something they also can't train you for. And, um, yeah, it's a whole other part of the job so that you can really only learn with practice, I suppose. Can you give me a specific example of a time on the set of Barry when you thought you failed, but that failure wound up paving the way to something that was great, but unexpected? Well, the hardest thing I had to shoot for the entire series, four seasons of this show with all the highs and lows and all the genres we explored, honestly, the hardest thing to shoot was this season episode four when I'm on the set of mega girls and Sally has to turn this terrible speech intentionally terrible. They, our writers did a beautiful job of writing a very piss poor speech um, that I then had to turn into, you know, something theatrically viable. And I, I was like trying to rehearse the text. I just, I do not know what to do with this. And I was trying to treat it like a Shakespeare soliloquy, you know, and trying to give the words the same kind of emphasis and weight, but it was so tough. And I, I got to set and I was really like, Bill, I can't do this. Like, I actually don't think I can do it. Um, and he's like, he was very encouraging and he was like, you can, you can make something of this. So that, that was the one that was the hardest one. And I, we don't do many takes on Barry and I, I can't remember, but I, I felt like I had to do that one again and again. And then in the shooting of it, Bill discovered the gag that if I just, as I turned to try to impress Sean Hader, if I just stepped a little bit to my right, I would totally eclipse Ellen Jameson, the lovely Ellen Jameson who played Kristen so brilliantly, even though she's about a foot taller than me and especially in those boots, like a foot and a half taller than me. But if I just stepped to the right, I would eclipse her in like a pure Sally narcissistic grabbing her moment moment um and so the comedy of that i could hear people laughing at the monitor and i didn't know why um but i was saved by the blocking <laughs> yeah so. how do you bring that scene up you have so many exceptional ones in this series 
that one in particular is is a personal favorite given where she's at in her life and how well it reflects what she's willing to do to you know get what she wants and also explore her craft more yeah i love i love the writing in that scene i just thought it was brilliant and there's so much fun commentary within that you know even the set everything and and we like built a marvel set basically on our stages like we hadn't walked into a set like that i mean it was this huge blue mountain and you know it was so cool like that's that reaction i have when i walk into the studio and say you know holy shit i mean it was genuine we we hadn't built something quite that ambitious um on our stages and until later when they built that sand pit. I mean, that was wild when the guys go through the sand, which they shot for real. Those stunt actors, I don't know how they did it. It wasn't real sand. It was some other material that they could safely inhale. But that for me was like the claustrophobia of doing that. But they, they did it and it looked amazing. But yeah, it was that that scene with Mega Girls I loved. And I love that we had Sean Hayter. She was amazing. And yeah, it was such a fun shoot. The writing was so clever. Oh, great. Now that sand pit scene will give me even more anxiety than no, it already was. No, they built this like giant <gasps> funnel. When I saw it, I was like, oh my God, you're not really going to do it, are you? So there's obviously like, there's a little bit of special effects at the end when the sand like fills, but otherwise it's a real stunt. They really went through the thing open. They landed on some kind of giant mattress. I mean, I, I couldn't show up to set that day. I, my nerves wouldn't have helped anyone. It's one thing to say, I want to be an actor. It's another when you step on a stage or set, you feel real confidence in your craft. So do you remember the first time that happened when you tapped into something that you were doing on like such a deep level that you knew you could reach it and that became a creative itch you had to keep scratching no matter what? Gosh, your questions are so um, wonderful and large. I, I, you're gonna, I'm going to be thinking about this for days. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, because I'd done so much theater as a kid, so much amateur theater, you know, but because of that amazing teacher I mentioned, you know, he treated us like professionals and taught us a really strong work ethic. I always knew where I was on a stage, you know, like I, I, I of course, I get opening night nerves like anyone and, and all of that, but I, I understood where I was. I, I understood the wings and the feel of it and the, you know, the sort of moments before and you're in the darkness and you can feel the audience coming in. I, I really got the rhythm of it. And the beauty about being on stage is, you know, it's a team sport. It's like once you get on, no matter how nervous you are, as long as you put your focus into the story and all of your other actors on stage with you, you can completely forget yourself. And, and I, I love the theater because of that. It's like you're in this the whole world goes quiet. Everybody's phones are off. And, you know, it's this, there's this tiny focal point in a world of chaos. There's just this quiet story going on somewhere in a dark room and everybody's agreeing somehow this like silent contract that we're just going to sit and tell this story and listen to this story. And we're all going to connect. And it's so, it's so simple. So I think my, my confidence in that came through my love of it and and also the sort of simplicity of it it's it's such a it's the oldest thing we've done and as a species you know since we could build a fire as we now know you and I can alone in the woods um <laughs> you know we, we got up and, and told stories to each other so it's so simple film and tv whole different ball game I I for years was terrified of the camera terrified and I thought I'm gonna be an actor but I'm just going to be broke for the rest of my life because I'm only going to do stage. I can't act on screen. I can't do it. Um, I was always so nervous going into auditions as soon as there was a machine in the room. It was like it punctured that thing I'm describing of everybody coming together. And I really had to learn over the years to love the machine. And the way, the way I've sort of achieved that, I think, is understanding the person behind the machine and that they are very much a part of this collective too. So like on Barry seasons three and four, we had the most incredible camera A operator, a guy called Don Devine lives up to the name. He shot all of Mad Men. He's like the best in the biz. And Don, you know, is there with this giant piece of machinery, but Don is as focused as I am on these tiny little minutia moments of the story we're trying to tell. So as soon as I could put my focus into the fact that Don is as focused as I am and we're together trying to make sure this story gets told the same way you would do in a play, all those nerves kind of went away and I was able to enjoy being on camera and 
find a kind of different way of performing and there's an intimacy you can have on camera that you can't have on stage. And so an actual like pinpoint moment, I don't know. I can tell you there were a lot of years, like I did guest parts on like elementary and I had a tiny part in a series over here called Any Human Heart. I remember having these amazing 1950s costumes, but all I remember was being petrified. I just remember being petrified and also there were so many people on set and I didn't know what everybody's job was. And it's not like your first day on a film or TV set, somebody holds your hand and says, okay, this is a gaffer. This is what a gaffer does. This is, you know, and you're sort of, you're lost. And so it took years for me to understand, you know, what everybody does. And once I understood everybody's role, then we just became this giant undulating octopus where you're like, okay, there's all these arms to this thing. And actually it's very much like doing a play. Um, so yeah, particular moment, no, but, but sort of all the moments accumulated. Uh, I got my, I got my sea legs eventually in front of the camera. And now the beauty of being on camera is if you mess it up, you can do it again. <laughs> so, you know, there's no reason to be nervous because you can just stop and start over. <laughs> I want to go back to something that you had brought up, uh, I believe doing the the audition and then it taking so long for the world to finally see Barry. It's just making me wonder, what is the biggest difference between how you played Sally back then? And then I guess who she became the more you dug into the character and explored her situation. Well, I think in the beginning I was, more nervous and i think also coming from theater i always felt like i needed to be overly overly prepared and like bill and i were like opposite ends of the spectrum like he'd come to set and not know his lines and i'm like bill i know you wrote it but like you gotta learn your lines like we can't get through the scene and like i would come so hyper prepared like for a play and he'd be like you need to throw it away like don't worry you don't have to stick to the script and you don't so some somewhere along the way we met in the middle and i think it was like really good for me to learn how to let go essentially like i feel like i the first couple of seasons yeah i just really 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 was overly prepared all the time like you know a plus student and i think you know, acting isn't about being an A-plus student, really. Um, and I think that in the last couple of seasons, I felt this huge creative freedom set in. Once I realized we're in this space that you can't fail, you know, you can't embarrass yourself. Um, I felt like you could try anything on that set. We were so supported by each other, by our crew. And so I, I felt like, a lot looser as a performer. And that was really uh, liberating for me. And I don't want to sound lazy, but there were then times when I'd show up basically completely unprepared and to, to kind of take the risk and go, you know, let's see what we can find in the moment. And with Barry, we did always have rehearsals, which was lovely. And we, we always connected and talked about the scenes ahead of time. Like that part is really important. And I don't think you can throw away but, you know, in terms of actually rehearsing specifically lines and how you're going to deliver them and, and that kind of thing, like finessing a performance, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't come in with my performance ready. I would find it on the day. And that was like a big that was a big leap and a big change in the way that I work. And I felt lucky to be on a set that that felt very supported. And we were able to surprise ourselves a lot. And that that was thrilling. Oh, with that mentality, I'm so curious to hear your answers about some of my like hyper specific questions. I'll I'll begin with something that happens in season two. We talked a little bit about this moment at the junket, but I did want to follow up on the whole uh, I feel safe with you line because I keep thinking about how safety can mean something to a whole bunch of people in different situations. So in that moment, what kind of safety do you think that Sally expects to get from Barry? And at that point, are there any red flags that could threaten that safety that she even has on her mind? I think there's such a tragedy to that line, you know, and it was a later addition that we added because uh, the first thing I shot in the season, the very first thing I shot was the end of episode four, when I see Barry totally beaten black and blue and say, you know, let's go. And I was like, okay, this is this is a leap um, and we need to build a few stepping stones to this leap to track what is going on with Sally to get there. And so the 
the prison scene seemed like the obvious place where we could connect with her inner psyche and what was going on for her that she ends up in a place that she goes with him and you know i feel safe with you in some ways is maybe something in life that you you would feel internally not say out loud um but we felt we needed to share it with the audience um and i feel like for her you know at the end of season three she's committed this crime and she's murdered someone and unlike the other characters in the show she's not someone who lives in a world of crime and has a profession that revolves around crime she's an ordinary person um who who, who murders someone so she's the first character that we're seeing having to process that in real time and barry was the only witness to the crime an, an accomplice you might say and um and she knows now that the, the this man was only pursuing her or or they only ended up in that horrible situation because of him and and his, his what he's previously done in his life so she i think she felt like you know he's seen her most animal self her most horrible side the ugliest person she could be and he's choosing to love her anyway and i think sadly it's a bit of a bear trap you know but she she needs that security someone who's accepting her you know the whole sally's whole arc in a lot of ways is about looking for a place of acceptance and you know she's in many ways such a tragic character and she i think she needs that to be seen in that light and he's the one who can offer that so that's part of it and then the other part of it is sadly i think because she's somebody who comes from an abusive relationship and she's she's played out that dynamic before she's sadly not seeing the red flags and she's falling into the same kind of cycle and she ends up in another abusive relationship you know albeit a different type of abuse more psychological form of abuse than physical but she's still very much in that with him so yeah it's a big relief to see her at the end of eight turn down that date <laughs> good for sally oh my god <laughs> oh, i just love how like like quick and and with authority that line is delivered it's not like wavering she's like like no yeah. i don't want this and that's it <laughs> even like with a hint of joy not in a rude way just like i think there's a bit of joy and relief in saying no you know and knowing that she can so yeah i feel like maybe sally's had some therapy between episodes or between the time jump and eight you know i don't know <laughs> to learn to say no big step Big step for Sally. I have to let you go. I could talk about this show no, all day long. Right. You have to come back to the Lighter Ladies Night. I would love to come back. I would love to come back. This has been so enjoyable. Your questions are so thoughtful and I really appreciate it. It was like just lovely talking to you and lovely to think about the show and the character from new angles myself. So thank you. I appreciate you saying anytime. that. Anytime. <laughs> The quality of my questions has to match the quality of your show. So I'm glad you thought that. Again, congratulations on all of Barry. Thank you. Thank you so much. So lovely to talk. I'll see you soon, I hope. Take care. Bye.